Well, joining me today on a day which, as I said, a paradigm shift in India's policy, I'm joined by ex-Army Chief General Bikram Singh. I'm also joined by Professor Brahma Chalani, Dr. C. Raja Mohan, and from the United States, Lisa Curtis. Thank you all very much for coming in. But first, let's just go across to Vishnu Shom, who has some of the inside details of how that operation was actually carried out. Vishnu. Sonia, thank you very much. Well, lots of details have emerged through the course of the day on exactly how India conducted this operation. And while there may have been one overall operation, I think it's important to point out mm -hmm. that the attacks that the Indian Army made across the line of control in Pakistan occupied Kashmir were over a frontage of 250 odd kilometers. And perhaps the biggest point in this one operation is that there were no Indian casualties, that according to the Indian Army. Mm -hmm. Now, how exactly did these, uh, these operations take place? Uh, what were some of the key points in the strategic, in the surgical missions which were carried out today? Let's take a look. This is the line of control between India and Pakistan in Jammu and Kashmir and it was across the line of control that Indian soldiers struck several Pakistani terrorist launch pads in places such as Bhimbar, Tattapani, Lipa and Kale. Ahead of the cross line of control operation, Indian gunners opened up on the Uri front, but in fact their real targets were elsewhere, along a frontage of a vast 250 kilometers. The camps which the Indian army struck were located between 1 and 3 kilometers inside Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. The terrorists at these bases belonged to various groups. Each launch pad had a total of 30 to 40 terrorists, including guides and their assistants. The Indian attacks were not just by foot. In some cases, helicopters may have been used to place Indian soldiers. The operations began shortly after midnight. By 4.30 a.m. it was all over. The attacks had taken place on forested hilly regions, with the Indian Army making it clear that full surprise had been achieved. And perhaps more significantly, there were no Indian casualties. This was an entirely successful surgical strike against precisely identified terrorist target SEA sources, which had been monitored for up to a week. And India has proof of this. Footage of the attacks was likely beamed live by India's Israeli-made drones. What's more, our soldiers may also have been equipped with cameras mounted on their kits. Vishnu Shom for NDTV. Well, to discuss the different implications of this breaking story, uh, General Singh and uh, Dr. Raja Mohan, Professor Chilani and Lisa Curtis with me. General Singh, former chief of the Army staff, when you look at what's happened today, the successful operation carried out by the Indian Army, what, what would you like to say? Well, I think, uh, let me first uh, congratulate the Indian Army, the Indian military, uh, the national uh, political leadership, the Prime Minister and the leadership down below. Uh, the nation, I must congratulate again, I think we've all stood together and this is the manifestation of what happened in Uri and after that you heard the DGM he brought out that we shall strike at the time and place of our choosing. And I think we had to wait for a number of days to make sure we assess the vulnerabilities, we identified the right kind of objectives, carry out a detailed SWOT analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And then we formulate plans, rehearse those plans and go in. And I think what you've seen today is an excellent execution of that plan. And uh, we have been able to deliver a message across uh, to the people who matter in Pakistan, to the international community, uh, more importantly to, to, to our people, because they were frustrated. I think the nation had crossed that threshold of tolerance mm -hmm. after Uri. And I'm glad that uh, a very firm stance has been taken by the government. Uh, there is political will today, and which is not only manifesting in, in the military, uh, you know, demonstration of military might and military operations. I think across the board, all elements of national power, the diplomatic, the economic, the psychological, the informational, uh, military operations in the, in the domain of maybe cyber operations, your, your soft power usage, hard power, uh, kinetic, non-kinetic means, all this is going to be used. And I think uh, this, this strategy is evolving. As I said earlier, uh, we couldn't have had this strategy earlier. It, it had to start from, the, from a political intent, which has been demonstrated now. So th that's really the big difference, you'd say, perhaps Prime Minister Lo uh, Modi's leadership at this stage and also the fact that 
many turning points had come earlier in Indo Pak, worse points, the Kargil attack, uh, the, the 2611 as well. And we remember during Kargil when there was huge American diplomatic pressure when Prime Minister Vajpayee at that time had also had to issue instructions that don't cross the line of control, that America was very worried that that would happen and the situation would escalate. What's the big strategic difference now as see, well? Uh, again, I, I'll uh, come to political will. You see, political will uh, when uh, they have announced and they have underscored the fact that there is nothing above national interest. I think that is the ultimate. And this is something which is loud and clear, which has mm -hmm. come from uh, the so far hitherto conduct of our leadership, their statements. You look at the Prime Minister's statement from the ramparts of Red Fort. He was very categorical. Uh, you know, there was nothing to hide. He, uh, G20 summit in China, there after the, the South Asian summit, you saw what happened over there. You've seen what he, what he uh, talked of in Kerala. So uh, it's, uh, this demonstrative of the political will, and everything starts off, Sonia, from the political will. If the nation has a political will, you shall be able to evolve. But the only thing I want to bring out is that this will has got to be demonstrated over a period of time. You cannot expect overnight results. Yes, you will continue to hit like this militarily, uh, showcase to the government, uh, to, to our people, to various players of the environment. But I think more importantly, it is the other elements of national power, the other prongs of the strategy, which is a multi-layered, multi-pronged, comprehensive strategy with the whole of government approach, this has got to be enduring. It has to manifest over a number of years. So you're saying it can't be a knee-jerk reaction, all the other elements had to come in and in, in that sense, uh, uh, Raja, the whole, what has been building up over the last week, the SARC, the decision to boycott SARC, the fact that the other countries in this region supported us, the tough noises on the Indus Waters Treaty, MFN, etc., part of a larger plan. Did these strikes, however, take you by surprise? Is strategic restraint now a dead word in Indian foreign policy? Look, I think the, the, as you used the word landmark when you began. I think the problem for India for the last 30 years has been how do you call Pakistan's nuclear bluff? How do you overcome the, the so-called fear of escalation? The fear of escalation had limited what you can do. So what they've done today, I think, is to get out of that. But this is just the beginning of the process. I fully agree with uh, General Bikram saying that the, this is not going to end here. This is going to go on. Mm -hmm. What we've done is today open that space for putting some pressure on Pakistan. And now the ball is in General Rahil Sharif's court. You, now, you're not was, saying Nawaz Sharif. No, it is not, because poor Nawaz has nothing to do with this. Uh, here is Mr. Sh General Sharif, who was about to be declared field marshal, celebrated as the greatest general, like every chief seems to be celebrated like that. Who's retiring soon as well. Yeah, so he has to now, while they deny it today, his problem is going to be, what does he do now? Mm -hmm. So I think we should prepare for escalation. Uh, we must expect escalation. And then I think all the factors that General Singh mentioned, from you know, you, how do you manage this crisis escalation, how do you deal with other powers, how do you deal with Pakistan, I think there's going to be a whole lot of play, but I think at least we're starting on a new course, which has got more possibilities, but is also full of some uncertainties. So, but this is uncharted waters we have embarked on, which is better than getting stuck in the fear of doing anything. So it's a, it's a beginning today, not an end unto yeah. itself. Let me just say what uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif actually did in Pakistan this evening, summoned the Indian High Commissioner, Mr. Gautam Bambawale in Islamabad. Also, Nawaz Sharif has called for a cabinet meeting tomorrow. He's called this uh, uh, surgical strike as unprovoked aggression by India. He's also called for a joint session of parliament next week, and he's asked to meet all Punjab, st uh, Pakistan state chief ministers. But bravado at this point. Prama Chalani, if you can come in here. You had written earlier, the, just about a week ago, but how this is really a test for Prime Minister Modi's credibility as well, that it is a turning point considering he came into power, in a sense, as a completely different leader. Has he lived up to your test, in a sense? Do you think this has actually established him as a leader in the ilk of someone like Indira Gandhi as somebody who's strong and will take decisions? He's broken away from, say, the prime ministers before him completely. He's established he is a different. Today's set of strikes are a potential game changer in several ways. First, India had locked itself in a straitjacket of indecision and inaction for years, which had created a sense of despair among the Indian public. You don't like the word strategic restraint? I'll, 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 well, strategic restraint is an idea prevalent only in India. You will know, there's, nobody in the world has ever enunciated the doctrine of strategic restraint in the face of aggression by an adversary. Mm -hmm. Only in India were people camouflaging strategic meekness or strategic neg negligence as strategic restraint. Strategic restraint was not a cost-free option. It began imposing escalating costs on India. It began undermining India's regional power status. 
it began emboldening the enemy to ratchet up its unconventional war. It rattled Indian uh, and international investors, and it encouraged the United States and its allies like Britain to diplomatically exert pressure on India after every terrorist strike. So there was a limit to how far India could restrain itself. But I think the most important thing that has happened now is that first, India has crossed the line of control. This is, India did not cross the line of control even during the Kargil War. Mm -hmm. Second, this narrative was built in India by a number of analysts that India had no credible military option vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. That narrative stands demolished today. In fact, that India managed to stage a daring cross-border military strike at a time when Pakistan is on full combat readiness testifies to how smart military power can be utilized. And more importantly, mm -hmm. by lifting this uh, sense of despair in the country, it's a great morale booster. Um, it will have major diplomatic, psychological, and political benefits in terms of military benefits. I think it's a limited strike with limited military benefits, but it cannot be a one-off strike because this is a game changer. And that's the big question, but how, what happens next? When we say limited, can we actually define that? Let me go across to Lisa Curtis perhaps on the American role because really they've, in that sense, uh, there has been uh, in India, some resentment in early years with a sense of balance of keeping India and Pakistan on the same scale. That has changed in recent years. But most comprehensively, perhaps today, with that statement uh, from Susan Rice's office after she spoke to NSA Dovel, do you see a big shift now in how the American role also in the whole Indo-Pak relationship? Yes, I think there's definitely a shift in how the U.S. is viewing Pakistan and its continued support for terrorist groups. And I think this obviously is a major shift in India's strategy, although I wouldn't say it's wholly unexpected. Mm -hmm. uh, the Uri attack was not the first, but the second Pakistani provocation within the space of nine months. And of course, I'm talking about the Tang Code attack in January, which followed closely on the heels of Prime Minister Modi's efforts to reach out to Pakistani leaders through his uh, Christmas Day visit to Lahore. So right. I think that uh, it's not unexpected sh shift in Indian strategy. And of course, the US uh, is concerned about escalating military tensions between mm -hmm. two nuclear armed states. But at the same time, the US uh, is not in a position really to criticize India for trying to prevent future uh, terrorist attacks on its territory. So it's I think it's important to keep in mind this is a punitive and it's a deterrent attack. It's not a provocation. Right. In fact, Lisa, that's, that's interesting because that's really what the DGMO has, and the government has stressed. This is a preemptive that we acted because we had information terrorists were going to attack Jammu and Kashmir and major Indian cities. So it's not just retaliation for Uri. It's a preemptive strike. I'm joined now by a minister in the government, Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad, who joins me. Mr. Prasad, we've been talking about how this is a game changer, a landmark day for India. What would you like to say, sir, today as a minister in the government? Because after Uri, there had been many demands uh, from uh, the people of India, from politicians saying the government must act. Why aren't they acting? Is it a weak government? What would you say today? First of all, Sonia, I need to compliment the Indian Armed Forces. I salute them for the great courage, ability, potential they have shown a precision preemptive strike doing causing heavy damage and returning without any damage to themselves mm -hmm. that is something truly extraordinary i am very proud of the leadership of my prime minister who has shown great courage political will power and extraordinary maturity in not only isolating diplomatically pakistan but also ensuring that those who play with the lives of Indians and our armed forces would be replied to very firmly. Now, you must understand, there is a context to our relationship with Pakistan. Narendra Modi ji went all out to have a good relation with Pakistan. Yes. Mr. Nawaz Sharif was called to the oath taking. We saw him there in the Rashtrapati Bhavan. We are quite surprised. Modi ji went to attend the marriage of his granddaughter at a very short notice, bypassing mm -hmm. many protocol requirements also. 
Sushma ji went there. Rajnath ji went there. There was Eid Mubarak. When Mr. Nawaz Sharif was going for operation, Modi ji wished him, apart yes. from all these things. But what reply came? Just Pathan court and then Uri and abject denial. In Pakistan today, it must be understood, Sonia, let me just say this, is becoming an epicenter of world terror, not only India. Attack in Paris, in Brussels, in London, in New York, India, Uri, Pathan court or wherever. There is one distinct angle waiting in Pakistan as the conspirator patronized by elements of the establishment. In fact, that's why also there we've seen the, the U.S. Patience. strong statement there, and we've seen Bangladesh has already come out in strong support of us. In fact, even China has stressed dialogue, but there's been not one country which has actually criticized India for its surgical strikes. But let me ask you, we have ex-Army Chief General Singh here who said that he wants to compliment the political leadership as well because the political will is what led to this actually happening. Would you say that in the sense of the Indian Army are the heroes for India today, those brave commandos, but do you think in that sense Prime Minister Modi is the political hero of the day today or the man who has changed the narrative of India's strategic restraint policy to a completely new Modi doctrine now perhaps? First of all, let me tell you very clearly, obviously our armed forces deserved our salute and full credit. But if a distinguished general like General Singh is complimenting the leadership of Narendra Modi ji, we understand that. Modi ji is a man of infinite courage. And always he goes for the extra mile, as I said earlier. But once his patience was exhausted, and as indeed from all of us, then he said in Kalikat, Koji Kot, in the big rally two, three days ago, the sacrifice of Indian Jawans at Uri will not be allowed to go in vain. And two things I would like to highlight here, Sonia. Mm -hmm. Indians, after 1971, for the first time crossed the LOC. Though technically it, we may not call it a Pakistan territory, but in terms of 1994 resolution of our parliament, POK is a part of India, of Jammu and Kashmir, under illegal occupation of Pakistan. But the surgical preemptive strike was truly extraordinary. And that is meticulous planning with taking into account all the implications possible. I, when you say take into account all the implications possible, are you worried about what could happen next? We've uh, heard Lisa Kurtz just now saying that, of course, when there's tension escalating between two nuclear countries, there is worry. Are you actually worried? Uh, do we have a plan for what could happen next, given the fact that the political leader, uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, may not be in control at all, the army chief there issuing strong statements, their meetings going on uh, with the MPs as well, though they've denied the surgical strikes, but are you worried about what could happen next? What if there's war tomorrow? First of all, since they are in a denial, Pakistan remains in chronic denial. Sonia, I was a young kid then, just coming out of the school in 1971 war when they lost Bangladesh. I remember Yahya Khan speaking on Radio Pakistan, I heard it myself, telling the people in a very guarded way that we have lost East Bengal. Though for months together they were saying we are winning the war. Therefore, this kind of denial is chronic to Pakistan. Good luck to them. It's none of our concern. But uh, why should we be worried? No. Once we took this decision, we have gone through all the pros and cons. And we are fully prepared to safeguard our integrity and also our security. That is not negotiable. Let Pakistan know very clear in unmistakable terms. If you will foment terror, if you will continue to create mayhem in India of innocent citizens and the armed forces, mm -hmm. you will be firmly replied. And uh, final question, uh, Mr. Prasad, uh, the all-party meeting, you've got full support. Uh, the Congress, other parties have all backed the government and the armed forces today. But interesting, of course, when at a time when there was a lot of mocking of what they said, the Prime Minister Modi's 56-inch has been reduced. And also you saw all the statements. Are also interesting today is that Prime Minister Modi is being compared to Indira Gandhi. Is that a comparison you would accept? And also, what would you like to say today to all those who uh, criticized what they said the Prime Minister Modi's 56-inch chest remarks were? 
Well, Sonia, first of all, let me tell you, today is the day when the entire country needs to speak in one voice. And I'm very happy that the entire country has spoken in one voice. And therefore, as the minister of this government, I need also to compliment all the political parties who mm -hmm. came, who have spoken in one void, supporting the government initiative and also complimenting the armed forces. That is what the hallowed tradition of our democracy is. Mm -hmm. I remember when 9-11 happened in Mumbai, I, was one of the, I also came on your channel. But we fully supported the government yes. at this great time of crisis. That's what India... But as far as measuring the chest is concerned, I leave it to Sonia and her friends or other people. We do our job and we do our job firmly in pursuit of security of India, which will always be dear to us and we shall never compromise. And Prime Minister Modi, strongest leader after Indira Gandhi? Well, that is a comparison. I leave it to you. Um, uh, India is very proud of its leader. What is wrong with that? If right. anyone is drawing any lesson or comparison, I leave it to them. But I am very proud of my leader, the Prime Minister, who has shown great maturity and heroic courage and qualities of leadership.